Oops. Good afternoon, folks. Sorry about the jittery camera work. There we go. Amateur. Um, welcome back to Advanced Higher Chemistry. We are going to be looking at indicators today. This is SQA pages 71 and 72. That's the learning outcomes. These are the four areas that I would like to tackle today, starting with the composition of a pH indicator. If you don't know what a pH indicator is, you're probably in the wrong place. We'll have a look at these other three as we go along. By the way, just before I leave, have we spotted the the colour theme that's going on here? Um, this is an indicator you probably would have first had contact with all the way back at National 5 called phenolphthalene, one of the world's least pronounceable names when you have a look at it. Um, and it is fuchsia pink in high pH and colourless in low pH. I've been trying to take tips off my wife, the art teacher. Let's move on to the definition and composition. Okay, indicators are, in fact, weak acids. Now, if you're not sure what a weak acid is, I'll try and put a link up here somewhere to my weak acids video. You need to go back and watch it, because if you don't know what weak acid is, you will have no idea what I'm blathering about for the next 20 minutes or so. Now, if they are weak acids, we know that weak acid reacts with water. Um, so you can have H2O. Now, I'm going to represent the indicator in a very odd way. Normally, if this was a weak acid, I would show it as, say, for example, CH3COOH, um, which isn't an indicator. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to call it indicator with an H joined to it. So this is a molecule. And these two are going to react with each other, of course, which is what weak acids do. And we're going to release an ion. Goodness me, sorry, I do apologise, folks. I'm going to release the negative ion. Uh, and over here, we're going to have H3O, the hydronium ion. Uh, now, the key thing here is I have chosen a different colour because that is how a pH indicator works. The molecule with the hydrogen, ion with the hydrogen attached to it is a completely different colour to the separate ion, the conjugate base, if you like, if you're going this way. Um, how do they do that? Well, we'll come back to that in section two in the very, very near future. But section one, basically what we got is indicators are weak acids. And the key thing here is the molecule form is actually physically a different color to the free ion. There is a dissociation expression that goes with them. Now we called it Ka for acids, this is Kin for indicators. And just like before, it's everything on the right raised to the powers over everything on the left, not including water. Sorry, water, because you're a pure liquid, remember they don't get included uh, in expressions of equilibrium constants. So you'd have, we should stick with the colour code, shouldn't we? I in negative um, times H3O. Con a concentration, sorry, get it right, hey. These are concentrations in moles per litre um, times the concentration of H3O all over the concentration of your indicator molecule, sometimes shown as HIN. I showed it as INH just to keep the same format as this. Makes no difference. It's the molecule with the hydrogen attached. That is the expression for the dissociation constant KIN. For point two, how do they change their colour? We have a couple of pictures which I have kindly printed off Wikimedia. Um, this is phenolphthalein. P-T-H-A-L phthalein. What a cracking name. This is phenolphthalein. Uh, and let me check which pH this must be. I'm going to cheat and work it out because I can see that this molecule must be colourless, so this must be a low pH. In other words, high acid content. How do I know that? Well, if I put the phenolphthalein at high pH alongside it, if I can actually separate these bits of paper, are these going to both fit in the frame? Yeah, they are. Excellent. Um, so we have got... Does it fit in the frame? Yes, it does. Uh, we've got low pH and we've got high pH phenolphthalein here. In other words, alkali conditions on the right, acid conditions on the left. Now, this is where you get a lovely fuchsia pink colour. Uh, and this, as I said earlier on, 
sticking with my colour code from the very first slide so it looks vaguely like I know what I'm doing. This is colourless. Oh, that shows up on the camera. My good old Pixel 4 XL, it can't let me down now. So, how do I know these colours? How do I know this is not coloured and this is likely to be coloured? I will hopefully pop another link back up here somewhere to my video on molecular orbitals and colour because it is all to do with the concept of conjugation. The wonderful jigsaw of chemistry links itself back together again because if you start here, we've got double, single, double, single, double, single, you get the point. This is all a conjugated structure here, folks. So therefore, it's likely to be coloured. This structure here, the conjugation is broken because we have double, single, double, single, and then these are all singles. So there isn't any conjugation. This is likely to be colourless. That's the reason the two structures are different colours to each other. If you're wondering why I haven't mentioned Universal Indicator yet so far, Universal Indicator cheats. It's actually like a vegetable soup. It's about four or five different indicators all put together. A true pH indicator that you would actually use in a titration has only ever got one colour or the other. It is a binary state system. Um, so that's the colour changing witchcraft. Let's have a look at why it changes at different pHs. To save me a little work, I've been lazy and I've popped back to this equilibria here, although actually I think I might have to rewrite it anyway. Let's rewrite it anyway. So as I said before, uh, what we might do is the simpler version and not worry about H3O, although it is, it is present. Let's just go with HIN. So that's the molecules falling apart to make the different colored ion and hydrogen ions. Now, I'm hoping that you might see that if we put this mixture here into an environment with lots of hydrogen ions, in other words, into an acidic environment, we are going to drive the equilibrium towards this side. So in an acidic environment, this particular indicator mixture would appear red. And if I can just squeeze it in the bottom here, if we stick the same indicator equilibria. So we have got our free ions and our hydrogen ions here. If we pop this into an environment where there are lots of OH hydroxide or basic environment, I'm hoping that you can perhaps see that these are going to get stolen away from the equilibrium, which means we're going to drive the equilibrium this direction and therefore in a high pH you get that colour. So that's section three. Why does the colour change with pH? And the answer is you're driving the weak acid equilibrium, either one side or the other. Susan from my class uh, made a very good observation. She said, how much of one side versus the other side? What ratio do you have to have of one to the other before you can say the colour has decisively changed? Which is a very good question. The answer the SQA tell you is that the ratio of the molecule to the free ions has to be, sorry, free ions, has to be 10 times bigger on one side or 10 times bigger on the other side in order to get a decisive color change. Now, because pH is logarithmic, that means when you change the concentration of one side or the other by a factor of 10, you change the pH by one click on one side or one click on the other side. It's at this point uh, that the SQA introduce a little equation here. They say the pH that the colour change occurs is equal to the P of the KIN plus or minus 1. Now remember, the KIN is just the ratio of one side to the other. The P is just the negative log of this, and that corresponds to a pH number. The reason we, we have taken the P of this is that it will let us see which pH this actually color, changes colour at. That is plus or minus 1 from the fact that a 10 times concentration change, when you negative log it, just becomes a click of 1. So that's why it's plus or minus 1. So that's the colour change pH range of any particular indicator. I've just realised that I've forgotten to print the page from the data book that will show us some examples of that. Let me go and do that. 
So if we have a look at page 14 in our data book, page 14 is a recurring theme for equilibria because it's got all the weak acids uh, here. And down the bottom, it's actually got a bunch of indicators and the pH range at which they will, in fact, change their colour. Um, now, excuse me, uh, what is the significance of this? Well, this sort of wanders into area four, back in my original um, learning outcomes. Suitable indicators for particular neutralizations. I want to talk about that in general, and then I've got a specific SQA question example for us to have a look at there, guys. Phenolphthalein, if we have a look at it, I seem to be slightly obsessed with phenolphthalein today. I just found out it was used as a laxative as well. Please don't try that at home. 8.3 to 10 is the colour change, which interestingly means it wasn't actually the best indicator for the National 5 reaction that we gave you. Uh, you'll see in the just 30 seconds or so time, I'm hoping to pre-draw these graphs so I don't bore you with drawing them. Right. What is going on here? Um, I am showing you four different scenarios here. The graphs of pH against the volume of the base. Here is the same scenario for all of these. We have got a quantity of acid in a beaker and we're titrating base into it from a burette. So these are our pH neutralization reactions. Only we've got four quite different reactions going on. The very first one, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. So this is a strong acid and a weak base. Sorry, strong acid and strong base. My apologies. Strong acid and strong. I'm jumping ahead. Don't try and multitask it. Just to stick to one thing at a time. So if you have a strong acid and strong base, you are going to start down here when there is no base put in. So the acid is going to start at super low pH and it's going to end up at a high pH after we've actually added too much alkali in, or too much base. So you get a pH curve that looks like that. Starts low, you get a super sharp jump up and then we're done. And the end of the reaction is around pH 7, obviously. That's the neutralization point. That's just when we've neutralized all this acid the next drop of alkali is actually too much and it takes us up to a high pH. So that's a pH titration curve for a strong acid and a strong base. And as I said, amusingly, uh, phenolphthalein actually was a pretty sucky indicator for that because it only changes pH uh, 8.3 up to 10. Even in the minus one, it's still 7.3. It's not great. The reason we actually used it is because it's a lovely clear colour change. That's the main reason. And you were all just noobs in National 5. You're all just beginners in chemistry, so we're trying to make life easier for you. Let's look at a different acid and base now. Let's keep the hydrochloric acid, but we're going to react it with, say, ooh, ammonia. Um, so this is a strong acid, but now we have got ourselves a weak base. Now, the pH is going to start at the same point way down here, but it's not going to end at 14, even if you add excess ammonia. You'd be lucky if it ends around about here. So also, by the way, and I've badly drawn that, sorry, my apologies, the, the, the slope of this is actually starting to go... I've really badly drawn that, sorry about that, guys. The slope of this, uh, the gradient, rather, of the changeover point is now slightly softer, which means it's becoming slightly more difficult to tell when it's just neutralised. Also, if we measure halfway down here, we're now this is the point where we have just neutralized all the acid. That is not pH 7. So we don't refer to that as the neutralization point, we refer to it as the equivalence point. I can't quite remember, that used to be in the course. I've got a feeling it perhaps isn't anymore. Let me just perhaps pause and double check that for you. Okay, the equivalence point is no longer in it, which is a bit of a shame, really. They dumbed that down a wee bit because you can obviously see why the equivalence point is not the same as neutral. Um, but my point is, for an indicator for this reaction, where you have a strong base, strong acid, sorry, and a weak base, you would need an indicator that changes colour less than 7. So, what could we do? Bromocrutal purple, that's a distinct possibility. Uh, Bromothymol blue, nah, maybe. It's not great. Oh, P-nitrophenol, yeah, that would be a good one. 
this is leading on to the SQA question, by the way. This is me showing you which indicator is most suitable for a particular neutralization. Let's do the next one. I'm hoping you can perhaps work out what I might be putting here. I'm going to put CH3, COOH. We're going to react that with sodium hydroxide. Now we have got a weak acid this time and a strong base. Now this time around, let me try and do a better job with the drawing. Sorry, guys. We're going to start somewhere well above zero, and we're going to end uh, nice and high here. So we're going to have a pH curve that looks something like that. And again, halfway between these two points, it's going to be around about there-ish. My point being, we need an indicator that changes colour somewhere above seven when we're dealing with a weak acid and a strong base. People ask about this scenario here. Um, weak acid, weak base for like sulfurous acid, say, and ammonia. And the simple answer is they are not suitable for titrations at all because the curve looks something like that. It's ridiculously gradual and you can't get a colour change accurately within a decent... You need a huge volume range in order to reach a decent colour change. Remember, factor of 10. Uh, and you can't get concordancy. That is literally a physical volume range. So the best one for sharp sharp colour changes and best concordancy are strong and strong, but that is not always possible. So let me round off this ramble with a little example of that. We have got from the SQA specimen paper, I think here, if I remember correctly, number six. Let me get rid of that. It's the background. There we go. Number six. Number six says, which of the following indicators is most suitable to use in a titration of dilute hydrochloric <laughs> and dilute ammonia. Oops, I didn't actually cheat with that. I would have preferred it to be different too, but nevertheless. Okay, so hydrochloric acid, that is a strong acid. Uh, and ammonia is a weak base. Now you see why you had to go and watch the weak acids and videos bases. Uh, weak acids and bases video, sorry. Uh, so bromothymol blue, well, if it's a strong acid, then we're looking for less than 7 for our pH colour change. So we pop our indicators back on again. We find these ones. Bromothymol blue. Uh, this a uh, oh I remember this one. This is a truly horrible, horrible question by a twisted person at the SQA. It's almost as if they were trying to mislead you deliberately. Surely not. <laughs> Bromothymol blue. If you look at this one, the very first indicator on this list is bromophenol blue which changes pH in about the right range. And under exam stress, that would be very easy to misread as that. And then move on to the next question. Phenolphthalein. Well, we already know that is a no because phenolphthalein is 8.3 to 10. We need less than 7. Methyl orange. Uh, I've lost methyl orange. There we go. Oh, 3.1 to 4.4. That looks like that might be suitable. And phenol red, phenol red is 6.8 to 8.4. So that's a no because that's effectively more or less 7. And we need less than 7. So that means that is our correct answer. Isn't that truly nasty? RTFQ, indeed, folks. Read the flipping question super carefully, especially at advanced higher level. Right. And I think we're done. Um, thank you for listening to my colourful ramble today. Hopefully it's helped you with pH indicators. Uh, if you are at Melbourne, we only have two sections left. We have thermodynamics and kinetics, and they will be uh, two upcoming videos, hopefully uh, in the very near future. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye-bye. Press the stop button, hey.